Hello, I'm Judith A. Yates, true crime author and criminologist. This is Best True Crime. Every episode, I take you on a journey to explore crime, forensics, and investigations. Hey everybody, this is Judith Yates, and this episode is True Crime, Ghosts, and Hidden History in Savannah, Georgia. Today, we're getting a close and personal look at true crime, ghosts, hidden history of nighttime in Savannah, Georgia. And with us is the best nighttime guide in the entire city, my friend and official guide and historian, Cassandra Bentley with Madcap Tours. We're gonna to talk a little bit about Madcap Tours later on because I definitely want you to visit them when you are in Savannah. First, let's talk about where we're at. Savannah is the oldest city in Georgia. It was established in 1733 on the Savannah River and has quite the history of war, crime, plagues, and other history related to true crime. But it's also a beautiful city. You see Spanish moss everywhere and trees that have reached for the sky for hundreds of years. The architecture is absolutely stunning, so you definitely have to visit this city. Now, Savannah initially became the British colonial capital of the province of Georgia and later it was crowned the first state capital of Georgia. This is a riverside city, important during both the Revolutionary War and during the American Civil War. Savannah is Georgia's fifth largest city. In the 2020 census, it showed close to 148,000 souls residing here. That is, the living souls. Yeah, Savannah, Georgia is the most haunted city in the United States, thanks to a bloody history of hangings, war, plagues, murders, discrimination, black magic, voodoo, live burials, crime. Throughout this city's history, there were pits of bodies hurriedly covered over, usually those affected and died by yellow fever, criminals who met the gallows and didn't deserve a proper burial or just those unwanted, unloved, poor souls that had no family to bury them. This beautiful, quaint savannah is built on top of thousands of graves, and this is what makes it America's most haunted city. In the early 1800s, it was very easy to catch a certain fever that was going around. If you were one of the unlucky thousands, the fever would spike and you'd be unable to move from the sickness. Then your organs begin to fail one by one by one. Now you're puking up black fluid that looks a little bit like coffee grinds and bad mud. Yep, you have yellow fever. Only prayer and hope can save you now, or so thought the citizens around you. The yellow fever epidemic of 1820 wiped out a huge population in the area and hit, hit Savannah hard. By September 15th, only 1,500 of the original population of 5,000 remained in the city. Yellow fever raged through the town until the end of the 19th century. And most of the dead were hurriedly buried in Savannah's Colonial Park Cemetery, and they were placed in mass unmarked graves. See, people were dying so quickly that they didn't have time for a proper burial, and the disease caused such horrific sickness that they wanted those bodies buried as quick as possible because people were catching it from one another. Now let's talk about Colonial Park Cemetery. Thousands of people have been buried here but they're only about a mm, little less than half grave markers here in Colonial Park. It is a beautiful cemetery and you definitely need to visit. Colonial Park was first opened in 1750. And around 1896, the borders of the cemetery was pushed back and pushed back to make room for the sidewalks and the streets, a move that included paving over numerous graves until it's the size that you see today. See these bricks with the circles? Well, each of these types of bricks represent a body underneath, or at least tries to be that many. Uh, this is the sole marker for these people. And this fire station, because it sits on the original graveyard plot, it rolls over the dead every time fire trucks are dispatched. And few people know about what's underneath Savannah and what lurks on top of the Savannah streets, like my guide, Cassandra Bentley. 
Some of the old buildings in Savannah are saved, but they're not preserved. For example, this unassuming building, it was once a blacksmith shop, and now it sits derelict and abandoned. This gorgeous church sits on a large section of land. Well, that's because a Jewish cemetery was raised so this church could be built. Those attending here walk over the unmarked and desecrated grave of an unknown Jewish population. And this, this is the most haunted room in this building. It is now called the 1790 Pub. There are spirits all around and not just the drinking kind, but you are gonna love this place, even if it's just for a soft drink. There's great conversation, friendly people, and a personal atmosphere, and it makes this place a favorite. But tragic history permeates the building itself. We're gonna talk about a girl named Anna right now. In 1790, a 15-year-old indentured servant girl named Anna Powell moved into this house to care for a much older gentleman. Eventually, the gentleman wanted more than dusting and scrubbing. He fell madly in love with Anna and proposed marriage. Now, he was more than twice her age, and Anna told him, nope, no dice. And that's when this gentleman turned ugly. He wasn't going to accept no, and he threatened her. If Anna didn't want to marry him, he could throw her to the streets and ensure she would never be hired anywhere ever again. Now, Anna came over here from Ireland and she was basically on her own. So she was forced to accept his hand in marriage. But Anna had a big secret. It seems a sailor who ship landed at the harbor close by had her heart. Now they met in clandestine get togethers. What was a girl to do? Next thing you know, Anna gets a baby bump. The sailor says, I'll be back, and the ship sailed with him. Anna's husband was about to find out she was with a child that was not his. Anna, tragic and broken and feeling that there was just no answer, climbed to the second floor window and threw herself off the balcony. She died from hemorrhaging. The room she jumped from is now room 204 in this marvelous historic inn. There have been sightings of Anna, and guests claim to have unexpected encounters, items moved from dresser, or they wake up to find Anna is standing over their bed at night. Anna's ghost haunts this area. So say the locals, and so say those who have actually seen her. And then there is Renee Rondelier. One of the most famous ghosts comes from a story of justice gone wrong. Rene Rondelier. He was such a huge baby that the doctors had to break his mother's pelvic bone for him to emerge into the world. And then he just kept growing. He was said to be almost seven foot tall, and it was also said he wasn't the sharpest kid on the block. Kids would forever taunt him as he grew and grew and grew. They'd chase him through the town, making fun, throwing stones, just being general bullies. So to escape the bullying, Renee would hide in the cemetery. And the kids avoided that cemetery, so Renee felt safe here. Then a strange occurrence took shape that remains a dynamic with serial killers of today. People began finding stray animals killed and ripped open, lying on the graves in Colonial Park. If you read enough true crime and watch enough videos, hint, you understand why children went missing shortly after the animals started to appear on the graves. Next thing you know, missing children would be found and they too were ripped open physically and displayed on these graves. Right away, the townspeople begin to suspect Renee. He was the town weirdo and his mother, fearing for her child's safety, locked him away in the house for months. But as bodies of these children begin to appear, so did the town's cry for justice. An angry mob formed and drug Renee out of his house. A rope went around a tree limb, and then, that quick, Renee Rondelier hung dead in the cemetery. While an end was put to Renee's existence, there was no end to the murders. After Renee was hung, more children appeared on the grave sites in the same condition. But rather than admit they might have killed an innocent man, the townspeople created another story. They said it was the ghost of Rene Rondelier stealing, killing, and displaying these children. 
the murder stopped, Rene was dead, and the city carried on. Now, many people have claimed to see Rene Rondelier's ghost wandering about and even hanging from the tree that was once used for executions so many hundreds of years ago. He will even follow people as they walk past the cemetery walls at night, his steps echoing against the stones. These four, uh, alongside the street here, just beside Savannah's own city hall, are the only ones still left open for those like us to take a peek inside. Now, I don't like to go too far into this one, as it is known to be uh, the most severe out of the four. Um, at the earliest, they are used as vaults. It's storage, so your earliest exports in Georgia would have been tar, kerosene, and lumber, some very flammable goods, actually the cause of the first great fire raging all alongside Factor's Walk here, uh, which is believed to be a cause of a lot of the shadows that haunt the streets late at night, but later on it becomes bigger cash crops like tobacco and cotton mainly being imported out of here, though still fairly flammable, and later on, after slavery became legal, purchased by one Joseph Bryant, very prolific slave auctioneer and owner of a business across the street who had in fact been auctioning slaves even long before it was legal, making use of the tunnel system, the entrance just behind us, to move them secretly beneath the streets and sell them to willing buyers. Um, but after legal, he could publicly purchase these vaults and increase his stock, bringing more and more women packed into here, uh, and men, uh, and change the walls themselves. Now, while that is believed to have quite the effect, especially on the earliest one, he would actually sell them straight off the street, even with it being legal, they would not walk these men and women across the street, believing that in the you know condition that they're in, having been staying in very unhygienic quarters, both those cramped ships and in these vaults, that if they walked them in the public area, it would offend the delicate sensibilities of the good southern women up above, or perhaps even attract the sympathy, sympathy of a northerner visiting the city. How many people do you think they would pack in here, like, like body to body? I mean, depending how many ships they're having come in, that would depend entirely on how many of them they could cram in. It was very tight situations. So people were just basically stuffed in here alive, waiting to be auctioned off. Very much. Like objects. Treated like nothing more than the cotton that had held its place earlier. Okay, guys. We're going to go in here. Our tour guide says that she's had too many weird experiences in here to check it out. She says that there is a feeling of not being welcome, uh, of, of you're not even supposed to be in here. And you can see along the wall where these metal round, like a hook was kept where the chains on the slaves were chained to the wall. So obviously they couldn't escape. But imagine this place being just stuff full of people, men, women, children, crying out for help, crying out for their situation. They didn't know what was going on. And up here, she said that you can still see the grates that covered that window. Now, this is solid brick. So the heat, the cold, I mean, there's ab there would absolutely be no air in here. So it would be no better than being on the slave ship coming into the country. And this is a very strange feeling right here. Um, almost like a cloak around you. It, it feels like you're, I feel like I have a dark cloak over me. Uh, walking here in the corner. Now, because of time and weather, some of the hooks have fallen out. And you could almost feel the, the, 
the cloistered feeling that somebody would get in here having come off a ship, marched down here, only to be chained up again. It's, it's a very, uh, very sad feeling. I, I, get, I get even feel my voice becoming hoarse. There's a cold space right here. Can you take note how warm it was inside that other brick structure? Yeah, yeah there's I'm kind of standing here in the middle. It's a very humid night in Savannah, go figure. Um, but when you walk through here, it's uh, it's warm. Uh, it's not you know sweltering hot, but it's warmer here. And then I'm walking here into the center, and you can feel cold. Now, I'm going to show you. You said there were some of the uh, metal bands still existing. Mm -hmm. That's where the door hinges would have been. It would have been two large double doors. Of wood mentioned. or? Uh, probably iron banded wood with that heavy chain and padlock keeping it shut. Okay, so you're talking about people just stuffed in here. Stuffed in here. Can't sit down, can't move. And then these two heavy wooden doors close. As she said, banded by metal with a lock and chain. No light. Except you think they're coming through the grate, maybe? The, the... Uh, I mean, even with the amount of buildings, I don't know if the sun could ever hit the right angle to put any light in here. So it's basically just being transferred to a slave ship that's on the ground. And again, there's one of the hinges. It's cold. It's uh, it just has a very strange feeling in there. And now that I'm out, I can hear my voice clearer, but back there, it started getting scratchier. This is a very strange place to be. So what we have here is a your specific tunnel entrance in that it's not connected to one of the vaults, but actually sits adjacent to them. So you can get a better idea of just how big these tunnels were. So uh, I'm five foot six and that's how high up it goes. Uh, the idea being that the main purpose of these tunnels was for moving cargo. You would have men hoisting heavy boxes from the riverside as it was a lot easier to freight them beneath the city than carry them all the way up to the street. This tunnel specifically connects straight to the basement of Tondi's Tavern across the street. You know, so many people come through Savannah to go over there toward the river walk and walk along the river and have a drink and an expensive meal and overpriced t-shirt <laughs> but they pass by here without even knowing this kind of history if you want to see some more strange occurrences that happened to me while i was in savannah be sure to watch my other video on the slave quarters at the owens thomas house all you got to do is subscribe and you'll be notified when it's available besides walking you through the house I had some very weird on-camera experiences. Today, Savannah is like any other city. It has safe areas and unsafe neighborhoods. Annually, the rate of crime in Savannah is 56.17 per 1,000 residents. If you're going to tour Savannah's dark side, you must go with Mad Cat Tours. Mad Cat Tours offers a variety of tours, including family friendly, where the kids can hear spooky stories without the gore or the fear factor. Now, several things I love about Mad Cat. Veterans and active military receive a discount. A portion of every ticket sold goes to the preservation and maintenance of Savannah's historic district. And all Mad Cat Tours are pet friendly. <coughs> There are tours for hidden history, true crime, and pub crawls to include the most haunted place in all of Savannah, so you've got to check them out. It's www.madcattours.com for more information. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Best True Crime. I'm Judith A. Yates, and I hope you subscribe. Be sure to visit truecrimebook.net 
and be safe out there. <laughs>